Well, hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. It has been almost an entire week since I have seen you guys. I've missed you. Um, I am, if you guys didn't know, I have been sick the last couple of days. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, the kids got sick, and then I got sick, and it's just been a mess. I am on my way to recovery. I'm definitely feeling better. I do not feel great. So this live is going to probably go by pretty quickly compared to some of the other ones. Um, <clears throat> but thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for your patience with me. And um, if you guys have not read what came out today in the Delphi case, make sure you guys, uh, I don't know, take a seat, have probably a couple drinks ready and just sit back and it, it's going to be, it's going to be a wild ride. Keep your hands inside the ride at all times. I see your comment right there. So anyway, so I am back and I am, uh, um, hopefully we can get back on track. There were so many cases I had planned on covering this week. And of course it was just not, it was not in my cards, but that's okay. We're going to get back on track. So, um, I know I was going to say hi to everybody and then we're going to get right into it. So hi, blue eyed beauty. Hi, Jen. What's up, Christy. Hi, Kel. Hi, Steph B. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Jamel. ETS. <laughs> Definitely better. Not, not a hundred percent, but I am better. You know, I'm, and I, I'm, washing everything let me just say i'm washing everything everything's getting washed in the house i'm just like everything in the house is contaminated shampoo the carpets <clears throat> ah so the i'm now thoroughly convinced that mcclellan is a vile piece of garbage right so that's why i said for anybody who has read you guys know what we're about to go through and anybody who hasn't you're gonna you're you're really gonna you're gonna go what the fuck um, hi, Gina. Finally, you've been missed. So sorry you've been sick. Thank you. Hi, Robin. Hi, hi Yellow Jack. Coolest intro ever. Thank you. Mandy. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Queen Elizabeth. Hi, Kaylee. Um, the kids are definitely better. Um, well, I think. I don't know. It's gross. Hi, Kiki. Hi, Kelt. Hi, Jen. Nancy. Hi, True Crime Fangirl. Odd structure. You've been falling asleep during everybody's lives because they've been really late. Well, I was actually thinking about, depending on how I feel tonight, that I might do a late night live maybe i'll do one in the morning i don't know because i want to go over all the idaho four stuff too because that's just going that's just crazy right now but let me keep saying let me scroll back down hi kaleida hope hi caitlin just finished reading it and looking forward to this oh yeah it's gonna be it's big just and then malicious and i love you hts it's your birthday hts it's your birthday today no way is it your birthday today is it your birthday today how do i not know that how do i not how am i not prepared i'm normally prepared for these things ATS, is it really? Is it because I slept for two days straight and now I don't know what the hell's going on in life? Damn. ATS, I'm sorry I missed it. Well, I didn't miss it. It's still here, but I didn't know it on my own. We don't announce birthdays after 30, though. Okay. So, everybody, no, it's not our birthday. Happy birthday. Damn. I'm normally on top of my game when it comes to birthdays. I fucked this one up. Where you get your tie-dye shirts. I know a friend makes them, but I love them and would love to order some. I can do that for you. Yes. Let me grab it. I can grab the link really quick because she is on Instagram and she does an amazing job. I can just grab it for you. And I need to get some new ones.
So this is her shop. And if they're not from her, my other tie-dye, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Alex Erickson. My other tie-dyes, which I haven't bought any from her for a while either, are from Alex Erickson. Um, she's a YouTuber who does tie-dye also. But this is where I get my shirts. Most of my most of my regular shirts, I have tank tops from Allie. But um, this is my friend Jessica. She does an amazing job. And let her know that uh, if you do end up ordering, just let her know that you're ordering and that I've sent you over there. But um, she does guys, girls, sweatshirts, pajamas, dresses, any shower curtains. The woman does everything. Um, okay. So like I said, we're going to get right into it. So let me pull it all up. And thank you to those of you who sent it to me. You all know who you are. I appreciate you very much. I woke up from a nap today and was like, holy shit, what is going on in this world? All right. So um, there was a few motions earlier this week that we didn't really go over because they were all filed ex parte, which is essentially that we're, we're not supposed to see them and Nick is not supposed to see them. Um, there was an interesting article that came out. I don't know if you guys saw it or not, but it was an article talking about that she had put in a new gag order. I don't know what why she would need a new gag order to do that. I don't know. What is dinging? I thought I closed everything. Sorry. Um, I mean, it's just essentially saying that the the attorneys that are representing the defense team are not under a gag order, which I think is not new. I don't know why they, I don't know why that matters, but it is what it is. Uh, hi, Veronica. Hi, Teresa. Okay. Hi, Spicy. All right. So... Did you guys all see that article about that? I thought that was really weird. I was like, well, she already has a gag order. It's not, it's not, it's not surprising. Um, okay, so this is the motion to suppress statements. We're just gonna go through them one at a time and we'll, uh, the, the major one that actually has the most information that we're gonna go through is the memorandum, but we're just gonna go through and we'll take them one at a time. So, uh, motion to suppress statements. The defendant, Richard M. Allen, by counsel Bradley Rosie, respectfully requests that this court suppress as evidence in this cause any and all oral and written communications, confessions, statements, or admissions alleged to have been made by defendant Allen during his pretrial detention in this cause. In support of this motion, defendant Allen states the following. Defendant Allen is charged with two counts of felony murder, counts one and two and two counts of murder, three and four. The clerk told me she knows nothing about a new gag order. Yes, thank you, Tammy. I was wondering, I was like, that doesn't even make it, it doesn't really make any sense, but maybe somebody wrote in and asked her about Hennessy, like Christy's saying, it's what I'm assuming. And she's saying, no, like that, the gag order has nothing to do with them. Like it has nothing to do with the attorneys that are representing. Did you get, okay, hold on. Let me see if I can, it was an article that um, somebody had sent and I was like, this is, it's weird. I'll pull it up really quick. Just um, um, don't fly. from a from a site called W. Oh, well, that's interesting. It's gone. I mean, Fox 59 still has it up, but the original website, WSBT or whatever it is, that website, it can't get to it. But Fox 59 still has it up. But I don't know if they say it's a new one because that wasn't the one I read. Um, judge has issued a gag order to prohibit the state and defense from talking to the media about the case, but that order does not extend <coughs> to the the attorney representing Allen's defense against the judge's attempt to boot them off the case. It seems personal. Look at this is about Hennessy again. This is hit. Yeah. I don't know, but it's weird. The one that actually had a WSBT, that link doesn't work anymore. This one's just talking about the old gag order and saying that it doesn't have anything to do with the new attorneys. Yeah, they must have gotten it wrong, but 
Yeah, yeah. That's see, that's interesting because I think that they just I think somebody, somebody who was like Hennessy's talking too much and he's violating the gag order, and then the court was like, no, listen, fools, Hennessy is not violating anything. He's not under the gag order. So, and then they're like, ooh, judge issues gag order that doesn't pertain to them. Why is everything so weird in this case, right? I can imagine some people who would write into the judge and be like, Judge, Hennessy talks too much. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Defendant Allen. Okay, we did that one. Uh, during the course of Defendant Allen's pretrial detention, it is alleged that Defendant Allen communicated incriminating statements to state actors and or their agents, all of which the state of Indiana intends to present to a jury at the trial in this cause. If you guys recall, we know that there was the, the, the supposed admissions of guilt or admissions that were um, told from Richard Allen to his wife, which Nick McClellan puts in the filing where he says like no less than five times and also to his mother. Then we have this group of people who have gone around YouTube who have been like, oh, but he confessed to the staff and he told the staff, you know, that he that he did it and so on and so forth. Well, you know, come to find out. Um, but it's interesting that, that, that this is leaked information. Um, but you know, they're like, no, 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 it wasn't leaked, but here, you know, either way it is what it is. Uh, during the course of defendant Allen's pretrial detention it is alleged that defendant Allen communicated incriminating statements to the state actors and or their agents, all of which the state of Indiana intends to present. The statements were involuntary and thus obtained in violation of the following a Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Fourteenth Amendment of the United States Constitution, and Articles 1, Sections 12, 13, and 14 of the Indiana Constitution. The statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of psychological and mental coercion illegally directed against the defendant, and such statements were therefore involuntarily given. The statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of physical coercion illegally directed this is just a little little um peek into what we're about to read as a result of physical coercion illegally directed against the defendant and such statements were therefore involuntarily given therefore any and all communications confession statements or admissions alleged to have been offered up by the defendant allen were elicited in violation of his constitutional rights under the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments to the Constitution of the United States and his rights under Article 1, 12, Section 12, 13, and 14 of the Indiana Constitution. Wherefore, Defendant Allen, by counsel, respectfully requests this court to, one, conduct a pretrial hearing to determine if the statements alleged to have been given were voluntary in nature, and two, suppress evidence in this cause any and all communications, confessions, statements, or admissions written or oral made by him subsequent to his arrest in this cause. So here we go. Like, we're going to have the whole C. Here's the confessions. And then there's going to be the debate on whether these confessions were obtained legally or, or if he was willingly giving up this information or if there was physical coercion as stated by the defense. So they file an appendix that goes along with this on a list of exhibits that they're going to put with this memorandum. Um, I think it's important to go through these because some people were like, wait, why, why are some of these things on here? But one, there's the court order for safekeeping that was issued on November 3rd, 2022. There's the deposition of Warden John Gallipo. Gallipo I can never say his name right. And I apologize. I just don't. I don't, I don't, I don't I, one day maybe I will. And this is all said and done. I'll probably say his name perfect all the time. Certification of certain questions in the deposition upon oral examination of John Gallipo. Affidavit of Warden John Gallipo, Westville Correctional Facility. Report of Treatment Review Committee, the TRC hearing. Oh, Gail, thank you. Aw, thank you. I appreciate that. C-dub. Hey, honey. Yes. Yes, you're as you are. You're going to, yes, you're going to have to load up on beta block. Yes. We're, we haven't even got to that part yet. So you're here just in time. So who contacted the media? I don't, I don't know. I think that, that, um, probably the same person who contacted the judge, you know, my thought. 
and then hopefully that uh that news station would be like well don't trust these idiots anymore they don't know what they're talking about so the report of treatment review committee so the the, re the treatment review committee obviously had a hearing and then audio statement of michael roberts um in the doc the adult Indiana DOC adult mental health order of 11-3-2022, a Westville video, audio statement of Timothy Weist, affidavit of Sergeant Joshua Roberts Robinson, we know that name, the affidavit of Sergeant Randy Jones, we know that name, another video from Westville, the independent neuropsychological evaluation, we talked about that last week, that they, they had just turned that over, that Rosie had turned that over to Nick McClelland. The WCU suicide monitoring. The autopsy report of Abby and the autopsy report of Libby. A statement of inmate Lacey Patton Jr. and a statement of inmate Jason Elliott. All right, let me ch catch up on chat real quick, and then we're going to get into the next one. She's anti def the defense theory. I don't think it's personal. Yeah. Goal is so close-minded that it's obvious. Yeah, and, uh, we investigated ourselves and cleared ourselves of any wrongdoing. Pretty much. Exactly. I was the first in and then got a call, so missed the beginning. What about the media and removed article? It was about that saying that the judge issued a new gag order, which didn't make sense to me. So I was talking about it, went to pull up the article, and the article's gone. So apparently they figured out it didn't make sense to them either. Hi, Jax. The prosecution will look stupid if they reveal these confessions at trial. Ooh. Well, they're gonna they're gonna defend them. You know that. And I mean we're gonna see. We're going to see a preview of that from all the very pro-prosecution social media sites. I'm LBVS. And, oh. Um, did the prosecutor in this case even pass the bar? Yes, it did, actually. That isn't. Uh, yeah. Um, if one's always dying by this time of night. Ah, hi, Patty. <laughs> All right. Well, hi to everybody that just came in um, while I was reading that. We're gonna get to we're gonna get to this one. Hey, John Williams, they will indict a ham sandwich after seven years. Ain't that a fact? I mean, isn't that the saying anyway? They'd indict a ham sandwich, so it's not really surprising. I think the defense is going with the trial, and all of this is for the record. Since I'm convinced, if there is a conviction, this is just a trial, a trial, trial. Yeah. The trial for, fat, for, for practice. Today is Thursday. Sea star yeah, I know. I've lost a couple, so I get it. Is this a confession? Seems more the muttering of a sick man in need of treatment. Well, we haven't got there yet, so let's we'll go through it. Hi, all eyes on Delphi. Long-term solitary confinement is an enhanced interrogation technique. Not sure that there's any way to view Mr. Allen's statements as anything other than coerced. Well... Yeah, everyone hit the like for ATS's birthday. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? We're gonna hit, we're gonna hit the big one. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a drink for. Well, it's long been speculated that the reason that he was put into the prison system that this whole, you know, quote unquote, safekeeping order was so that they could get a confession out of him. That's what they wanted. And they didn't believe they would be able to get that in, in the jail system. So they wanted to put him into the prison system to have him confess. That was ultimately the goal. Um, does anybody remember, actually, we'll talk about that after we, we'll talk about that after we read this.
Okay, so <clears throat> facts. Defendant Allen was arrested in October of 2022 and immediately detained in the Carroll County Jail. Can you guys see this? Let me go up one more. There we go. Allen was thereafter transferred to the White County Jail and ultimately charged with two counts of felony murder. The charges were lodged against him on October 28th, 2022. On November 3rd of 2023, the Carroll County Sheriff petitioned the court for an order transferring jurisdiction of Allen's custody from the Carroll County Sheriff to the Indiana Department of Corrections. On the same day and without the formality of a hearing on the sheriff's request, Judge Benjamin Diener signed an order, safe keep, signed a, an order, the quote unquote safekeeping order, transferring Allen's custody to the IDOC. Without Allen or his legal representatives having any input in his pretrial detainment, Allen was then shipped off to the Westville Correctional Facility and placed in a maximum security segregation unit referred to by prison officials as WCU. The records suggest that just prior to his transfer to the WCU, Allen may have made a brief stop at the Reception Diagnostic Center where some sort of intake procedure may have taken place but it does not appear that Allen underwent any formal mental health assessment or testing to establish a baseline in terms of his mental health history or needs. Okay. This has to do with his legal representatives at the time. See if Allen didn't have, yeah, he didn't have an attorney. He didn't have attorneys because he was going to hire his own. And then he writes to the judge and says, I didn't realize like I, there was no way I could afford that. Um, okay. So from approximately November 1st of 2022 through December of 2023, Allen remained incarcerated in the WCU. Allen's attorneys are unaware of any other pretrial detainee that has ever been housed in the WCU in the history of the facility and most certainly not in the five or so years preceding his placement. Hi, Sleuth Intuition. It's good to see you. I've been catching up on your... Um, your Delphi everything's I was way behind. So doing a good job. I appreciate those. Um, Allen's attorneys have conducted depositions, watched video from Allen's cell and other video from within the prison, reviewed prison records regarding Allen's detainment detention, reviewed Allen's medical and psychiatric records and listened to audio interviews of prison inmates and guards conducted by law enforcement officials. Okay, let's break that down real quick. They watched the video from Alan's cell. Because remember, he's being recorded like 24 hours a day, essentially, is what they're saying. Hi, Carla. You didn't get the notification. It's okay. We're, we're just getting into the big the big one right now. So um, they reviewed his prison records regarding his detention. They reviewed his medical and his psychiatric records. They listened to audio interviews of prison inmates and guards conducted by law enforcement officials. Okay, so that's they oh they and they conducted their own depositions. They listened to the audio interviews of prison inmates that were interviewed by law enforcement officials. That's interesting. I wonder in regards to what? What were the law enforcement officials interviewing them for? In regards to this or just like in general, like other ones. Okay, through this process, Allen's attorneys have learned that Allen has been accused of making incriminating statements to both inmates and guards. Nearly all of these statements appear to have occurred between mid-March of 2023 and June of 2023. During this time frame, there also exists medical psychiatric records suggesting that Allen was in a state of psychosis. See the attached report of treatment review committee that this is the TRC hearing. <clears throat> okay, so to, to other inmates and to guards. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Nearly all the statements appear to have occurred between March of 2023 and June of 2023. Which is, I think, April of 2023 was when they're saying that... Um, He confessed to his wife and his mom. If I remember, I think it was April 3rd. I was trying to think of the date. Incriminating isn't confessed, though. All right, 
me see. They're like Baston. They're like Baston is not credible since he's in prison, but these other guys, they're complete gold. Yeah, and you think that like okay, it's a you know they can't have best on because he's a piece of shit, right? But these other ones are going to be better. I don't know. Hi, Buttercup. I am not a troll, and I can't believe I'm even here tonight. It really hurt me when you said the Idaho for the girls were a nine or ten, but made a laugh on BJ that the boy was only a four. Buttercup, I don't not, what. Are you talking about that the girls were at when I are you talking about from like a year ago? Well, I'm sorry that that hurt your feelings. I it would have just it would have been in jest. You know, personalities can take a can I know I think I know exactly what you're talking about, but I didn't realize that would have hurt anybody's feelings. Are you friends with Jack? Okay, so anybody who's confused, what Buttercup is talking about is when I was covering the Idaho 4 case, um, I said that like the that Maddie and Kaylee were like 9s and 10s, but Jake and Jack were um, like 4s. But, I mean, personality, I don't know them personally, so I think that they're... Uh, I think it's, I mean, I think it's okay that they loved each other. They loved each other. Some people are fours. It's whatever. I know that's kind of, they don't, I don't think it's personal. I mean, shoot, back in the day, I would have considered myself like a, you know, an eight or a nine. And now I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, three kids later, you know, it's, it is what it is. I mean, if I'm a four, I'm a four. <laughs> like, I, it definitely wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been like to hurt anybody, Buttercup. And so I apologize if that hurt your feelings. I really do. I do it was not personal. Um. And you are welcome here, and I know you are not a troll. Jervell's like, I rate myself a four. I think most men punch above their weight anyway. <laughs> I'm a four on a good day. <laughs> oh, Cakey and Mother of Dragons, you guys are funny. You're, you're a ten. Yeah. But I don't, I mean, I'm not ever saying anything like that to hurt anybody's feelings. Marshall, you are absolutely not a negative four. You better knock that shit off right now. Hi, Miko's headphones. Who just popped in that was like, hi, Laundered Amber. All right, it's fun to watch the Fig Solves narrative float on self. Join me for birthday cake and champagne. Okay, let's get back to this. So, but I am going to end up, uh, we'll be talking about Idaho very soon. So you can come back and listen for that one. And I, I, I'm probably still going to say that there are four, but I don't, it's not to hurt anybody's feelings. They're just kind of fours. All right, so where were we? <clears throat> so he's in, he's confessed to the inmate. So that would be why they're, they're doing those. They're, they're doing those depositions. Nearly all these statements appear to have occurred at the same time as the ones to his wife. He's also having he's also in, in having a report of treatment review committee hearing, and it appears that he is potentially in a state of psychosis. Now, this is going to come down to not what the attorneys have to say. This is going to come down to what the medical negative four, FYI, on the on that Rockaways negative four. That's where I would go with a negative four. Um, during this time frame, there also exists medical psychiatric that suggest it. So it's going to come down to what they say. This isn't going to come down to what the attorneys say. This is going to come down to exactly what these medical professionals say. Um, Allen's defense team has learned that Allen was not only detained in an isolation cell in WCU, but the prison officials chose to post inmates at Allen's cell door and required the inmates to keep logs of all of Allen's actions, statements, and behaviors. This appears to have occurred during all hours of the day and continued over the course of much of Allen's stay in the WCU. These inmates, all of whom are convicted felons, were not only actively engaged in surveilling Allen's activities, 
but were also communicating with him from time to time. Allen's attorneys have also learned that at some point in early April of 2023, prison officials deliberately pulled the inmates from Allen's cell door and replaced them with prison guards. Allen's attorneys have learned that this appears to have been prompted by an inmate or inmates engaging Allen regarding his pending charges and communicating Allen's thoughts and words to the families of these inmates, thereby violating any sense of confidentiality that might exist within the walls of the penitentiary. So let's go. Let me let's go through this. If you have somebody who's not convicted of a crime, he's not convicted of anything. He is accused, but he's not convicted. And they put him in solitary to keep him safe from other inmates, right? And from himself. So he's supposed to be under surveillance to keep himself from harming himself, right? And then he's supposed to stay away from other inmates because of the type of the type of, you know, um, crimes that he's alleged to have committed. So they put inmates at his door to have them monitor everything he's doing. And then those inmates start talking to him about the crimes that he committed or that he's alleged to have committed. And then they start making phone calls to their own families and telling them things that he's saying. Now, if that is true, I don't, <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even. Hold on. Let me check chat real quick. I did not say that about Ethan. I'll just clarify that. It was not. It was about Jack. And you can go back and find the clip, and I will prove it to you, because I think Ethan is a 10. This is, I, I, I don't even, there's like, there's like lack of words here for me <laughs> when it comes to some of this. Um, causes of acute psychosis include trauma, medication, hunger, and sleep deprivation, which is part of what was accused was that he was, uh, he, they were like shitting on his food and he wasn't eating and then he was eating paper. I mean, I don't know. That's a. He was never evaluated for that. The S watch was an excuse. Well, they, the, 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 they say that essentially he was not, he was not suicidal until he went to Westville. That's what they claim. Once he was being locked up in Westville, then he said he was, he was suicidal. Ironically, he supposedly, you know, gets cleared from all of this and he's doing so much better and then he gets transferred to Wabash. And then the first thing out of their mouths again is as soon as he's transferred to Wabash, that he is also now again suicidal. It, it's a very weird, like as soon as he's brought in, that's when he's, and I'm not saying that he, that he wasn't, but I don't know. We haven't seen anything that says he was yet besides them just telling us. They wanted, yeah, I've always kind of gone with the whole, did he get put in there because they wanted the confession? Other people have suggested that he was put in there because they wanted him dead and then the case would be closed. Yeah, the old jailhouse snitch routine, but in a prison. But you have him on a safekeeping order to keep him away from dangerous people who are going to do something to him. And instead... I don't know. 
that appears to have prompted by an inmate at the, and they are engaging with Alan regarding his pending charges and communicating Alan's thoughts and words to the families of these inmates. So they're getting, they're getting the info that they want or that we don't even know if they actually got it because we don't see the recordings yet, but then they're going and telling their, their friends and family about it. And then ironically, these, these, friends and family are potentially telling other people on social media. And then social media is like, he's confessing again. He confessed. He confessed. Sleep deprivation. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay, so this is John Gallipo was deposed by the defense on Friday, March 22nd, where he acknowledged he had worked in the IDOC for 28 years and was the warden at Westville for approximately five years leading up to Allen's placement. He acknowledged that during his entire tenure, he was unaware of any other circumstance involving the pretrial detention of a man who had not yet been convicted of a crime. I think that in itself is going to weigh heavy on on the, they're going to have to, I think the prosecution is going to have to show why they really thought that he needed to be in a prison. Because for most common folk, you don't ever think that before you're found guilty that you're going to be held in a prison in solitary confinement for two years. That's not like normal. No, ATS, just wait. We're going to get there. Mm -mm. Most notably, Allen's living circumstances within the, within the prison appear to have been designed, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to expose him to some of the harshest conditions that even the most heinous of convicted offenders have not endured. This coercive environment was initially the product of Allen being detained in an observation cell used for convicted inmates with suicidal ideations. This single cell located in a pod is one of approximately 60 individual segregation cells, all containing felons convicted of crimes such as burglary, robbery, child molestation, and murder. Each and every one of these inmates had the ability to communicate with Alan by yelling at him at all hours of the day and night, by chastising him every time he was removed from his cell for purposes of recreation, showering, or other administrative reasons, Allen's attorneys have learned that he was referred to as a baby killer and that he was the target of other similar accusations during his stay at the WCU. Uh, not, that does not surprise me. Um, this is of CO Roberts. So correctional officer, Michael Roberts prison records reflect that Allen was placed on suicide watch during the majority of his stay at the WCU, including upon his initial detention in November of 2022. This occurred despite the fact there were no underlying findings to suggest he was suicidal. Allen's designation as suicidal subjected him to even harsher circumstances than those of other offenders on the unit. For example, Allen's bed consisted of a metal plate with a thin mattress, all of which was just a few inches from the concrete floor. Allen was issued an anti-suicide smock, which covered his body no better than that of a garment of a caveman. Alan's food was served to him through a cuff portal and his dining habits involved him sitting on his bed or on the floor as his cell was not equipped with a table or chair that would otherwise serve as a rudimentary dining arrangement. Alan's cell contained a steel toilet and a sink, both in direct line of sight of the inmates and guards assigned to his surveil. So he has to take a shit and then they're going to watch him. Hi, Gray. It's good to see you. And you're wrong, but you've probably only watched the ones that I actually talk about with the defense says. Um, but welcome back to the channel. I always appreciate you being here. Hey, Gambies. Okay, Buttercup. I, 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 I may have made fun of his mustache, but it doesn't mean I think he was a four. And I'm not sure that you don't have to continue. I, I apologize that it hurt your feelings. I don't know what else to tell you. I think it's time that we either we either mend fences or we part ways. And you guys, I don't care if you like gray, you have to stay respectful. 
no name calling. Um, but you know, and it, it is, I mean, it, it's interesting though, because I do go through both, both filings from the prosecutor and from the defense. And I tell you guys what my opinion is. I, I do not believe one side over the other. I'm literally sitting here saying like, we're going to need to see this, or we're going to need to see that before we can make, before we can just say, Hey, this is what it is. But if this is true, and I constantly say, if this is accurate, this is a problem. And I say that for both sides, anybody who's pro prosecution, I would love to make sure that you guys do the same. That's really it. It's just making sure that we end up getting justice for the girls, which is what the whole, you know, crazy hashtag of justice for Abby and Libby that people are getting pissed off about. Like, I think that ultimately most of the creators that cover Delphi, I do believe that everybody wants that. Everybody wants the same thing. We just want the right person put behind bars. And as much as we want to say we believe one way or you believe another way, ultimately what we believe and what we come on here and say our opinion is doesn't matter to anybody except for us. Because it's we're not on that jury. Those 12 people who are going to sit on that jury next month are the ones who are going to determine whether this man is actually guilty of these crimes. We don't get to decide that. So we're just sitting here telling you guys our opinions. And it's okay if your opinion is that he's absolutely the right guy. And, and it's okay if you think that he's not the right guy. I, I'm undecided. And I, anybody who actually watches this channel knows that I am undecided. And my feelings about the prosecutor don't, have, don't immediately correlate to how I feel about Richard Allen. But, I mean, if this shit's true, if this is true, why would we ignore it? I think that's the problem. It's like the same thing where people are like, well, how are you going to explain the bullet there to all like the pro he's super innocent? How are you going to explain the bullet? How do you guys just ignore it? Well, if he's being treated this way, all the super pro prosecution side, if this is the truth, how do you ignore it? I just, that you, we can't ignore all those things. We have to take everything into consideration and go, okay, if this is factual, this is a problem. This isn't okay. This man is not convicted of anything. We may think that he's absolutely the right guy, but he's not convicted. And anybody who knows our constitution knows this is not okay behavior. This is not how people get treated. Okay. Anyway, let's get back to this because like I said, this is a big deal. I mean, they here they've got their exhibits. They're the ones who are going to have to present this to a ju to the judge and she's the one who's going to ultimately decide. Hi Deeds. It is always interesting, I know. This isn't even how those convicted are supposed to be treated. <laughs> but don't you have, is it not weird if it's if if you're accused of a crime, you're put in jail, you're transferred to another, first you're put in jail, right? You're not even arrested yet. You're just, you know what, we think you did it. We don't even have a probable cause affidavit signed. We just think you did it. So we're going to put you in jail for 48 hours until we can get the judge to sign off on it. Then we get the judge to sign off on it. We put you in jail. We transfer you to another jail. And then we're like, oop. We don't really think that we can house him in our jail because, you know, there's just going to be so many threats from the other people and, you know, people are going to want vengeance for what he's done and so on, you know, what he's accused of doing. So then we, we're going to, we're going to issue him to be transferred to the DOC. We put him in the DOC and we say, oh, he's suicidal. So we get him into the DOC. Now he's suicidal. And then we're going to put him in segregation and we go, <clears throat> Hold on. I don't know. I'm trying to talk and not read the. Com if anybody is name calling to anybody, mods, can you just delete those comments? Do not call other people names. Don't care if you guys like each other. Don't call anybody a name.
Okay, so we we put him in the we put him in the DOC. We say he's suicidal, so we can get him into into segregation. We put him in segregation, and then we put the worst of the worst who are also in segregation there for um, you know by his cell to keep an eye on him and log what he's doing. But yet he's the we are putting him there because he's suicidal. But yeah, we're going to have these people who are taunting him and telling him to do all these things. And that's why we put him in segregation, which I'm not surprised that they're doing that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. That's that it would happen in jail. It would happen anywhere. They're going to call him the baby killer. Once you're accused, it's like, you're. I mean, that's a label that's going to stick with you. It's okay. Yellow jacket. I, I, I feel the, I feel your, I feel your words coming through anyway. <laughs> Like mental telepathy, I got you. This channel is very pro defense, so that is very clear. Why is it a problem? Oh, because I'm not very pro defense. Uh, I, I don't. I think that you're misunderstanding what pro defense means. And for me, and and not for anybody else, but I can only speak for myself. I'm very pro constitution, but that doesn't mean when I say like. For pro defense, it's like rah rah rah. Baldwin and Rosie are the best things since sliced bread. I don't necessarily feel that way. I have a problem with some of the things that I see happening. I've, I have a problem with some of the things I see happening on both sides, but I more so have a problem with things that I see happening with law enforcement and the things that law enforcement's being accused of. And if those are factual things, those are a huge problem. The stuff that's happening if, if from this document being factual we could only read what's being written but that doesn't take away whether i think it's possible he actually did the crime and so when i when people say like pro defense i guess for me that doesn't mean i think pro richard allen is innocent so i, I guess maybe i should read i should figure out what you're implying by saying i'm pro defense because for me it's like i don't know i'm pro constitution I'm pro. I want to know what the fuck happened. I'm very pro the truth. Yeah. Like if, if they end up proving that Richard Allen is the guy who committed these crimes, I ain't going to be mad. And I don't even use the word ain't, but I just did it. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I can't believe he did this. I'm not going to be like that. <laughs> but I, I also, there's a whole thing that has to happen before we get there. And I keep trying to explain to people, and I don't mean it hurtful, but this is the trial of Richard Allen. This isn't this isn't a trial of for Abby and Libby. The outcome is more for Abby and Libby. But the trial itself, if everybody just goes, okay, Richard Allen is guilty. Who needs a trial? It's all said and done. Look at that. We've got we've got justice for Abby and Libby, and all is well in the world, right? Is that does is that okay? Like, do we just not give him any type of any type of fair you know fair trial, due process? If you think every defendant you cover is innocent, I think pro defense is a fair term. Okay, well then, perfect. I'm definitely not pro defense because I don't. <laughs> we were just talking about Brian Koberger, and I absolutely think he's the right guy, uh, and many others. I just have a problem with all this pre-trial stuff here. That's where I'm at. He might have done it. We know that he's innocent, innocent, he's innocent. And I'm totally okay with people who believe that. Buttercup, you didn't get timed out for telling the truth about anything. You're getting timed out because I asked you to let it go. We either have to move on. You're talking a year ago. If you're still holding on to something I said a year ago, 
that I don't, I'm going to say, I didn't even say you're, I'd be happy for you to send me the proof of it, but that's not what the channel is about. So, I mean, you, you trying to gaslight everybody into thinking that that is what it is, is wrong. I'm asking you to let it go, stay in the chat, engage in the conversation we're having. Otherwise, I mean, you came in saying you're not a troll, but if you keep going, then I don't know what else to think. I mean, you're absolutely welcome here. Do you want to build a snowman? It doesn't have to be a snowman. So, all right. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's do, let's do this. Give me one second. We're going to, we're going to fix something. I should have done it before the live, especially after the last Delphi live we did. I don't know why this, this case brings so much hate from people. When I, I really do think that the bottom line is that everybody wants the same conclusion. Everybody wants the right person to be put away. Just people aren't convinced. Some people are completely convinced and some people aren't. I don't see anything wrong with that. Like everybody learns and gets convinced of things at a different time. And some people may never. They go, you know what? Uh-uh. You didn't have enough to prove it to me. Build me up, buttercup, and don't break my heart. I walked into a whole shit show. You sure did. Hi, Jinx. I heard about that through the grapevine. Heard through the grapevine. Yeah, I turn on subs only. I don't know. We'll see if it works. I mean, uh, some people are s subscribed anyway, so it is kind of just what it is. I, you know, I apologize to you guys that I'm even engaging in it. You know, I just don't. I, I just, I'm gonna stop reading chat. I've got the best mods in the world. You guys will take care of it. If you are an asshole and you get timed out, then sorry. Okay. <sighs> This occurred despite the fact that there were no underlying findings to suggest that he was suicidal. Allen's designation as suicidal subjected him to even harsher circumstances than those of other offenders on the unit. For example, Allen's bed consisted of a metal plate with a thin mattress. And I know I already read this. I'm reading it again so we can all be on the same page. All of which was just a few inches from the concrete floor. Allen was issued an anti-suicide smock which covered his body no better than that of the garment of a caveman. Allen's food was served to him through a cuff portal and his dining habits involved him sitting on his bed or on the floor as his cell was not equipped with a table or a chair that would otherwise serve as a rudimentary dining arrangement. Allen's cell also contained a steel toilet and a sink, both in direct line of sight of the inmates, guards, and assigned to his surveil. So essentially anything he did in there, he was being watched by other inmates who actually are convicted of serious crimes. The toilet bowl was located approximately 24 inches from his bed. Allen's attorneys learned that Allen was not only under constant surveillance, but that the lights remained on in his cell for many days and nights. Holy shit. It is also true that due to his suicide watch designation, he was afforded less or no recreation time and less. Sorry, I had to sneeze. Oh, Cindy, that's so nice of you. Thank you. I don't always agree with everything you say, but I still love you. And I love you too, Cindy. See, that's the greatest part about this. So we can just talk and chill and have conversations. Ooh. Okay. So none of these things do I think are out of the ordinary when it comes to a convicted inmate who is, who is actually evaluated and deemed to be suicidal. So I don't think that this is all on purpose just for Richard Allen. And, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more. What this is, was it, what, what they're suggesting it was, is it's de designed that he was put into this prison and told that he was suicidal so that they could put him in this type of 
environment intentionally. The environment isn't made for him, if that makes sense. There are other inmates who are subjected to exactly this after being evaluated and deemed to be suicidal. And this is the protocols that the DOC has put in place to protect those people. The problem is, is he's not convicted of anything. And what they're stating here is that there is no actual evaluation deeming him as suicidal or understanding any type of his past mental health issues. So yes, ordinary, this, this circumstance, extraordinary. And the, so the lights are on in his cell for days and nights. Doesn't know if it's nighttime, doesn't know if it's daytime. Um, it, he's basically wearing a, a smock. He was afforded less or no recreation time and less of an opportunity for showers. In essence, his suicide designation was the cause for the removal of additional privilege, privileges to the extent the word privilege even applies which in turn further fostered an environment that led to the deterioration of Alan's mental and physical health. I, I just want you guys to think of that. Like you're living your everyday normal life and you're taken from that. You're dropped in within a, a couple of weeks, not even a week. It would have been a week from the 26th to the third. I think it was you're dropped into this And all for nearly 13 months. It does. It kind of does. And this is what the other wasn't it the other attorneys who said it like they reminded them of a of a POW. People kind of took offense to that, but I'm like, ooh, this is just a normal guy that is doing normal everyday things, and then all of a sudden he's dropped into this. Now, if they have something that shows that he was truly evaluated and he was truly suicidal and they actually did this mental health evaluation, you know, from before. I don't, that's why I said, this isn't going to come down to what the attorneys say. This is going to come down to what these mental health people end up saying, whether it be psychologists, whether it be the people who actually treated him at the prison. Yeah. His life is over, whether he's found innocent and released. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. I think it's just concerning, like, if, if, if he's innocent, if he didn't do it, that this is what we as a society are capable of. That's, I think that for me is what, like, that's fucking scary. Like, that could be my kid. That could be my husband. That could be my brother. Yeah, he'd never been arrested before, much less incarcerated. <clears throat> pluck, yeah, pluck any one of us from our ordinary, ordinary everyday life, deposit into a hellhole, and see if you remain unscathed and just fine. Good luck. No way. I just like this man is is legally an innocent human being. It's ah, uh, that's fucking scary. In all, for 13 months at the WCU, Allen was deprived of any social interaction, very very little to no privacy, limited recreation time, and was left to entertain himself. Besides these other inmates that are that the prison is okay with putting outside of his cell to talk to him, I mean that. I think anybody who kind of knows anything, you're you're hoping that he's going to confess to you. That's kind of what they're doing. It's it's very intentional, a jailhouse snitch, but. You can't say one's more trustworthy than the other then, right? I mean, that's, I don't know why jailhouse snitches are garbage anyway. Unfortunately, Allen's unusual detention circumstances would extend beyond the door of his isolation cell. Whenever Allen was removed from the confines of his 12 by 8 steel and concrete wall, he was shackled, aka his cell, um, he was shackled with ankle cuffs, a belly chain, box cuffs on his hands, and guided around by guards with a lead are what most people refer to as a leash. 
As if this restriction of his basic freedom of movement was not enough, prison officials assigned a videographer to Allen to record his movements around the prison, including when he would meet with his lawyers. During all the meetings between Allen and his attorneys, he remained shackled, making simple tasks difficult, such as taking a drink of water from a water bottle. Allen would not be able to communicate as much as a hand gesture due to his shackled state. During other meetings, prison officials placed a video camera outside of a window in the visitation room and required Allen to sit on a hard plastic chair directly in line with the video camera, which was less than 10 feet away. This one we know, this is the one that the order came out, I think it was June or July of last year, where she told them they, they could not do that anymore. Allen's highly unusual detention circumstance extended even to visits with his wife. During one visit, Allen was transported outside of the WCU to a building reserved for visitation for those inmates in general population. Allen again was shackled and confined during the transport and ultimately re-robed into a green jumpsuit before seeing his wife. He was, however, unshackled during the visit. His embrace with his wife was controlled by prison protocol, which permitted only a few brief seconds of contact despite the fact that Allen had not seen his wife for the better part of six months. Allen was required to sit on the opposite side of the table from his wife and had two prison guards stationed within earshot of each end of his table. They were left with absolutely no privacy. That, that's not, Unfortunately, that is not uncommon. That's just how it is. You, do, you, don't, you don't get privacy when you have visitors. That's just not, not how it goes. The room was completely empty except for his lawyers and a few other prison guards were also stationed within the building. This provided no background noise whatsoever, which might offer up some aspect of privacy as he and his wife tried to communicate and his restrictions did not end here. Alan and his wife were also denied the simple concession of getting a drink of water during this visit, despite the fact that there were a number of vending machines and a water fountain within 10 to 20 feet of his table. So once again, this is not unusual for convicted felons. I, I think that the biggest point here has to come back to that this man is not a convicted felon. Now, the no privacy with his wife, that's not uncommon. Those visitation with anybody is is recorded. Yeah, jail, prison, doesn't matter. Like, there's no privacy there. So I think that one's a bit of a stretch. Um, but I think they're just trying to show, like, look, they, you know, he, they did do this, but even when they did this, this is how they treated him. Um, now... The not getting a drink, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to end up being important or not. But, you know, sometimes they like to put some extra stuff in here just to kind of show all the things. Usually you can get drinks and snacks. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering, especially because I'm wondering if, like, that's even what the protocol is for somebody who is convicted, who is convicted, and in segregation if they would be allowed to because it's like essentially they're treating him like he's already convicted and that he's had all of these types of evaluations done you know what i mean because like there's a lot of things in here that were like yeah that's normal but it's not normal for somebody who's not actually convicted of a crime County puts you in a turtle suit, Velcro, no underwear, you sleep in a boat, which is a piece of plastic on the floor. It's terrible. Oh, shit. Actually, they say here a lot of his conditions aren't imposed on the convicted inmates either. All right, we're going to keep going. In Wisconsin, they used to have big-ass burgers for the microwave in prison. Really? Oh, that's a fair point. It's based on the totality of the circumstances surrounding the confession as a not yet convicted individual. This makes sense. No snacks. Ah, oh, dang. Yeah, there is a reason that the worst possible punishment is referred to as the whole or isolation. If RA is acquitted, he's going to get paid. I, oh, gosh, I would think so. I think, I would think so. But see, here's the thing. This is the other part that's, uh, that's also, it's it's scary. What if he is the right guy? What if he is the right guy? 
and they go through all of this stuff and they fuck everything up and he gets to walk free because th they pull so many shenanigans to make sure that they get him and to cover their own asses on all the mistakes. Okay, Allen's intake records with the DOC reflect that he was 5'5 five, five, five and 175 pounds at admission on November of 2022. His weight by April of 2023 had dropped below 135 pounds. We all, I think we all remember this, where this is when they were started taking his, they had his photos and they were like, those are staged. And it's like, you can't really stage him, you know, losing 40 pounds. But even at the time, I was kind of like, you know, this could be two things. It could be the fact that he's, He's got a guilty conscience. It could be the fact that he's being mistreated. I, that's going to be a tough thing to prove. Okay. Um, his wife to try to communicate, and his restrictions did not end there. Alan and his wife were also denied the simple concession of a drink. Okay, we went through that. Alan's unusual detention involves an even stranger set of circumstances. During the course of the representation of Alan, his attorneys discovered the existence of dozens of and dozens of police reports, audio interviews, and other investigative findings that centered on a group of suspects associated with pagan Norse spiritual religious practices. Hold on. Ever. Absolutely the Rockaways. I say that all the time. I don't care if you're innocent. I don't care if you're guilty. I don't care if you think you might be guilty and you don't remember. Get a damn attorney. Never, ever talk to cops without an attorney. Okay. So they, they discovered the existence of dozens and dozens of police reports, audio interviews, and other investigative findings that centered on a group of suspects associated with pagan nor spiritual religious practices. These suspects considered themselves Odinists all of which were referenced in the Frank's motion and memorandum and second Frank's motion and memorandum previously filed with this court. Allen incorporates herein the details referenced in the Frank's filings rather than restating the lengthy details in this memorandum. Allen's lawyers also discovered that at least two guards assigned to his pod and or his movements around the facility also held themselves out to be affiliated with the pagan Norse god known as Odin. See the affidavits of Joshua and Joshua Robinson and Randy Jones. We've gone through those. <clears throat> the guards proudly displayed their Odinistic beliefs on their own prison uniforms, despite the fact that such a display was in direct violation of their uniform policy. This is from his, from Gallipo, the warden's deposition. But remember, I thought the warden said that he had okayed them to do it and told them to stop doing it once the Frank's memo came out. <clears throat> Or maybe he just didn't care. But as, remember, as soon as as soon as they were told to take them down, take them off their, their uniforms, one of them went and got the tattoo on his face to make sure that everybody could see it all the time. And at least one occasion, one of these guards tased Alan after he was placed into his secured 8x12 cell because Alan refused to remove his hands from the cuff port in the door of his cell, a cuff port that is barely large enough through which to slide a meal tray. Allen posed absolutely no risk to anyone at the time he was tased. <clears throat> so he had his hands in the food port. They told him to move them, and he didn't. So they tased him, but he was inside of his cell. But it was essentially to teach him, like, you're going to do what we tell you to do. And you're either going to listen to the instructions or you're not. Even though he was no risk. And do, you do what you're told is what they're, what they're essentially reinforcing. They tased his hands. And that is on camera. Alan had also battled depression through most of his adult life. He was medicated over the course of his life and, in fact, had sought out therapeutic resources to treat and manage his depression. <clears throat> the IDOC gave very little consideration to Alan's condition 
at the time of his intake and initial incarceration into the WCU, especially given the unusual circumstances in which he was detained. It is also believed that Allen's medications were administered in a less than consistent fashion while he was on the unit, all of which would have contributed to his inability to endure his living environment during his pretrial detention at the WCU. The facts and circumstances surround the possibility that these individuals, otherwise known as Odinists, are specifically referenced in the Franks motion. Independent neuropsychological evaluation dated 331 offered up to the court in appendix form. <clears throat> Hi, everybody that's just popping in. Did he, did he smoke weed for his anxiety or for his uh, depression? I mean, that's tough. From somebody who, you know, and I've been pretty open about this. Like, I I've had, I suffer from major panic attacks and anxiety disorder. And I have for many, many years. And I've been on medication for, for many years. I could not imagine if somebody put me into that situation and took away my medicine or gave me my medicine inconsistently. Oh, yeah, that would be... And that's a that's my personal opinion on that. And everybody has their own, and that's fine. But my personal opinion is if you did that to me, like I can feel my anxiety going up right now. And I don't know that that happened, but that's essentially what they're saying is like it's not in it's not consistent. I'd lose it. I would. I would lose it real quick. It's literally life-threatening and a legal form of medic med for a medical provider to do that. Yeah, I like. I I legit thought I was having a heart attack. I mean, it gets bad. That's why I'm like, I don't know. So the issue is that in, in this case is whether the state violated Allen's Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights and federal and state due process rights by detaining him in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison segregation unit while he was awaiting trial. Allen's statements were made or Allen's statements were involuntary and should be suppressed. Now we're going to go into some of the law. Coercive police activity is a necessary predicate to finding that a confession is involuntary within the meaning of due process clause. However, coercive police activity is not a necessary prerequisite to challenge the voluntariness of a defendant's statement under Article 1, Section 14 of the Indiana Constitution, as there may be other elements that would tend to support a finding of involuntariness. The proper standard under the Indiana Constitution is whether the confession was freely self-determined and the product of a rational intellect and a free will. Thus, courts looked to the totality of the circumstances to determine if the confession was voluntary, taking into account many factors, including one, whether the statement was made under a court order, two, use of police trickery, three, threats or promises by police, four, defendant's race, age, or disability, five, the length of the detention, six, physical coercion, or seven, illegal police practices. And they're going with six here. So the analysis is notwithstanding the lower standard for showing involuntariness set by the Indiana Constitution, it is indisputable that Allen's detention circumstances were manufactured by the Carroll County Sheriff purposely and without the existence of any sense of due process. As the court signed the safekeeping order without requiring the state to establish the burden of proof required by the statute. But this was just the beginning. Allen was then shipped off to the WCU and immediately placed on suicide watch in a detention cell where he had little to no accommodations, not even those offered up to the other 2,000 convicted inmates housed across the prison yard. This is from Gallipo's, Gallipo's deposition. Almost simultaneous with Allen's isolation from human contact, Prison companions were placed at his doorstep and tasked with the duty of reporting his every move and recording his every word. Is this like a program that they have? Is this why, is that why it's in quotes? Like, do they actually offer this type of program where you get a prison companion? Hold on.
Huh. The companions appeared to have gone above and beyond this duty by communicating with Alan about his case and even praying with him as he struggled to withstand the rigors of his incarceration. Here's the audio statement of the guard, Michael Roberts. Okay, their mere presence at his doorstep is akin to Messiah versus United States, where police obtained incriminating statements from a jailhouse informant who engaged the defendant in a conversation and developed a relationship of trust and confidence with the defendant such that he revealed incriminating information about the charged crime when counsel was not present. The court held that this was improper and suggested the statements. This trial should do the same. This trial court should do the same. The trial court's decision regarding admissibility of a confession or incriminating statement is controlled by determining from the totality of the circumstances whether the statement was given voluntarily rather than induced through violence, threats, coercion, or other improper influence so as to overcome the defendant's free will. Standard indicators for voluntariness include whether the confession was freely self-determined, the product of a rational intellect and free will, without compulsion or inducement of any sort, and whether the accused will was overborne. Here, Alan's free will was overcome by the forces of his environment, all of which were placed upon him by the government and its actors. Alan, a man with a bona fide pre-existing mental health issue, was detained in an isolation cell entirely isolated from any sense of meaningful human contact, and then offered up the most basic amenities of life through a cuff porthole in his door. He was reduced to sleeping on a mattress that was placed on top of a steel plate just a few inches from the floor. The same mattress and floor also doubled as his dining table because his cell had no such accommodation. His attire was reduced to nothing more than a suicide smock covering only a portion of his body. Alan's healthiest accommodations came in the form of recreation time to not to exceed four hours per week. In this space, there was not enough room to jog or run, only an exercise bike and a pull-up bar. Alan's other accommodation would have been a window slit that was inside his cell. His view of anything outside of the boundaries of the penitentiary would have been impaired by the rusty chain link and razor wire of at least two separate fences between him and any sense of freedom. To the extent Alan was ever allowed to be removed from his cell, he was shackled at the ankles, wrists further confined by a belly chain and a cuff port, and guided around the prison on a leash. All ideal ways to confine and control the movements of a convicted killer or some other convict who, in addition to his conviction, posed a threat to himself or the prison staff. Allen, at 5 feet 5 inches tall and 173 pounds soaking wet, and without a single criminal conviction on his rap sheet, met none of those conditions. I just want to stop here for a second. You guys remember when they when they were talking about putting him in, um, I think it was Cass County. Were they talking about putting him in Cass County? My brain isn't working right. I think it was Cass County, and they said that... Uh, they said that they didn't. It wasn't good for his recreation because they didn't have a basketball court there. Like he was, like he played basketball all the time. Hi, human animal. Hi, alley cat. Hey, lone pony. They don't let them keep their hands in the ports because the handles are extremely heavy and will slam shut. Doesn't mean they should have tased them, but that, that's why it's against the rules. I, I like I, I'm not in disagreement with you. I think that the the whole point of it is that, that he had to listen to what they said, and if they didn't, if he didn't listen, then you know that's that was the outcome. Suicide prevention mostly is about intervention techniques. Once suicide has been attempted or spoken of, or if signs are there, it's about taking away plan opportunity. That's it, sadly. I think the problem here is is what they're saying is that during his intake. It wasn't actually something that was uh, was evaluated, you know, for like um, his history. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm catching up on chat. I just sound a little wrong. I know sounds. Sounds a little, uh, here's your prison companion. Mm 
This is your 24-7 convicted murderer companion, buddy. <laughs> Libertarian. He's not convicted. I think that the biggest thing is going to come down to that this is all what's happening to somebody who's not a convicted felon. Hi, Allie. I was talking about you earlier. I was talking about your tie-dye. But they have to treat him, too. And that's part of the reason that they say that he's there is because the DOC is who has the mental health, um, the mental health uh, background, or not background, the people, I can't think, like I said, my words are not coming, um, staff and the ability to treat him. But I think that's part of the issue is that if they're saying that the evaluation from before does not actually have anything to do with him being suicidal or talking about his previous history. <laughs> Two times speed is over. I sound like a normal human being again. Yeah, I think that that's where they're going with this is that they weren't, they didn't actually do the, the correct intake to be able to say, hey, this person needs to be you know, on suicide watch for a year or six months or whatever it ends up being, you know, before he's he's released from suicide watch, but not from segregation. Doolin didn't take the report. Hey, Criminal Network. Can you show me where that where that is? Because the Frank's memo has Doolin saying he took the report. So I'm confused on that. People keep telling me that, but. Doolin says he took the report, so I'm confused. Can you show me where that is? Besides a YouTube channel. Usually, even if you go in a 1013 suicidal after two days, a judge has to make the decision and the jail has to prove why, to my knowledge. Oh, that's interesting. Unalivable, but I didn't want your chat to get you hurt. Well, I, I know that the chat is more restricted on words than I am. Um, so I don't I don't know what you can write in there without with YouTube not wanting to come and just take your comments down. And then people are like, my comments are deleted. And it's like, yeah, YouTube doesn't like that. Um, Doolin is on the witness list, but he is a silent witness. He's the one who's talking about the recordings, though. So I, I would love to, I've heard this before about the Skinner stuff. I would love to see proof of it. I, I've not seen proof of it. And everything I continue to see proves that Doolin is the one who is saying, I took the statement. Doolin's saying, I took the statement. And in the Frank's memo, his deposition is saying that he thinks he recorded it and he'll go back and find it, but he doesn't know where it is. They've always said Doolin. I know. I don't know. I don't know. I Like I said, I've heard that people keep bringing up that it's the Skinner guy. I, the only thing I can kind of come up with is that I've heard, and I think it was from Ruckus's channel, that the wife after Skinner passed away saw a notation in one of his what, like notebooks. Doolin never took the statement. Why do you – wait, I want to – my, it skipped. Doolin never took the statement. Liggett claimed he did. Why do you think the recording disappeared? Well, I mean, shit, I don't know. With these people, every, every fucking recording disappears. So, <laughs> but Doolin is saying he took the statement. So why would Doolin say he took the statement and that he recorded it? There's an exhibit number. Yeah, there's an exhibit number listed for Doolin's report for the grocery store interview. There's nothing listed about Skinner. It, why... Oh my gosh, Seth, hi. It's so good to see you. And thank you for the super chat. That's what I keep hearing that, but it doesn't make sense. So that's where I'm saying like, so does he just call Skinner and say, hey, you know, I, I was there. And Skinner's like, hey, we'll go down to the grocer because that's where they're taking all the reports. And then he goes down there. That would make sense. But that wouldn't mean that he took the initial report. There's no report then. The report is 
actually labeled <laughs> yeah i do i keep hearing it yeah you're okay human animal and i'm not saying that it's wrong Doolin will never testify to that fact i yeah i if you've got something, I'm open to listening. I'm actually more open to listening to you than some others. So if you have something, absolutely let me know. Hi, Leah. Yeah, that's a huge issue for the prosecution because the only other statement they have from Alan is recorded interview where he states he was there from noon to 1.30. In the free world, it's knowledge of suicide is a thing. Finding out what is the plan and removing pills, keys, guns, and perhaps having person to go to the hospital. At this point. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's why I'm saying I think their issue has to do with the beforehand, um, you know, the evaluation before he's determined to be suicidal. Oh, okay. Well, I'll see you later, honey. Okay, I'm in school for healthcare management and public health, and we are actually taught now to do mental health first aid and not to call it SW, suicide watch, because people have ideation. Well, that is very interesting. It's like an evolved. Way to do it. Hi, Patricia. Did you miss anything good? Oh, yeah, you missed a lot of good. There's a lot of good. Well, bad, bad, but very interesting. I bet Alan regrets calling into the tip line. This oh, somebody did say like it's in there that he called the tip line. I think she's talking like though it's like evolving into becoming a little bit you know, like doing a health like mental health first aid or even more of a, a mental health. What do you call it when um, like you're being checked in? I can't think of the word. Uh, triage. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, like a triage. Like, where are you really at? Like, how far into this are you? Ideation is different than having an active or pre-plan kind of like first, second. And yeah, that's all I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. It's like a triage. Thank you, guys. But I think that does probably come with like a, the in, the fact that it is evolving and people are taking more notice of what is actually going on with mental health. I mean, we talk about the mental health crisis all the time and it's like an intake with an assessment. Hey junior. Well, the problem is they at least used to tell people they couldn't be forced into therapy unless they were homicidal or suicidal. So it tips people off. Hmm. Oh, but call, calling it suicide watch makes people not actually report these feelings because they are terrified they will get put on a hold because of it becomes an extreme. All right, let's get back to this so we can keep going because you guys, we haven't, we haven't even finished. Um, was ever allowed to be removed from cellular shackled to the ankles. We read that on a five foot 103 soaking wet. He was not a single conviction on his rap sheet. He met none of those conditions. As if this treatment wasn't enough, Alan was forced to endure the intimacies of his restraint systems even while he was meeting with his court-appointed lawyers inside the confines of the maximum security segregation unit located inside of the Westville Correctional Facility. And to add insult to injury, Alan's meetings with his attorneys occurred while he had a video camera aimed at his face, recording sessions that should have been afforded the most private of environments so as to protect the relationship between attorney and client. All of this occurred while Alan's medications were being adjusted by the prison medical team, the combination of which factors reduced him to nothing more than a human experiment. Alan's free will was overcome. I think this is going to be a, a big deal. 
the medications that he was on and what they were giving him is going to matter. Under the Indiana Constitution, the voluntariness of a confession must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And in reviewing voluntariness, the courts look at the totality of circumstances, reviewing all the evidence in the record, rather than focusing only on the evidence supporting the findings of voluntariness. Under the U.S. Constitution, the prosecution only has to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the confession was voluntary. As explained below, the state cannot meet its burden of showing voluntariness here, even applying the lower standard of preponderance. The federal courts have a long history of regulating the admission of confessions that have been a product of state action that exploits the weak and compromised through inter um, inter interrogatory and custodial processes. In Blackburn versus the state of Alabama, the Supreme Court noted that it had recognized that coercion can be mental as well as physical, and that the blood of the accused is not only not the only hallmark of an unconstitutional inquisition. A number of cases have demonstrated, if demonstrations were needed, that the efficiency of the rack and the thumbscrew can be matched, given the proper subject, by more sophisticated modes of persuasion, a prolonged interrogation of an accused who is ignorant of his rights and who has been cut off from the moral support of his friends and relatives is not infrequently an effective technique of terror. Thus, the range of inquiry in this type of case must be broad, and this court has insisted that the judgment in each instance be based upon consideration of the totality of the circumstances. Hi, Scottish Queen. I hope you're doing well. I uh, left the birthday party for Madalena here in my town. We're still hopeful. Aww. Seth, you're always such a good advocate. Allen's case falls within these federal parameters. In Blackburn, the defendant had a documented history of mental illness, having served in the military, which ultimately resulted in his discharge because of a medical finding that he suffered from some, from some form of psychosis. He was in the process of being treated in the days and weeks leading up to the commission of the crime and his ultimate apprehension. After enduring an eight to 10 hour interrogation, Blackburn was given a prepared written statement with admissions offered by him in the course of the interrogation. And he ultimately signed the written statement two days later. Okay, so that was for Blackburn. So here, Allen endured a longer, more sustained form of interrogation, one that lasted more than five months before he was finally broken. Already suffering from a bona fide mental health disorder and then having been cut off from the moral support of his wife, his mother, and daughter, Allen was weakened to the point where he slipped into a state of psychosis plagued with grossly disorganized, delusional, paranoid, and highly dysfunctional behavior. These behaviors were manifested through verbal confessions that he may have been drugged, verbal confessions to the double homicide, inconsistent with facts about the crime scene, periods of not sleeping for days, paranoia, stripping off his clothes, drinking toilet water, covering himself with and eating his own feces, and many other sociably, socially unacceptable behaviors. Did you hear that? I'm going to read that one more time. The behaviors were manifested through verbal confessions that he may have been drugged. Verbal confessions to the double homicide, which are inconsistent with the facts about the homicide itself. Periods of not sleeping for days. Paranoia, stripping off his clothes, drinking toilet water, covering himself with and eating his own feces, and many other socially unacceptable behaviors. On one occasion, Alan confessed to molesting those two girls and shooting them in the back. So this is the transcribed statement of inmate companion Lacey Patton Jr. On another occasion, he professed his sorrow 
for molesting Abby and Libby and others which he specifically named. This is from the correctional officer Michael Roberts statement. These facts are known to be falsities, none of which are supported by the autopsy findings by Dr. Roland Kaur as the cause of death of the girls and unsupported by the absence of any evidence that either one of the girls were sexually assaulted near or before the time of their deaths. See the attached autopsy reports for Abby and Libby. At the time Allen uttered these falsities, the state actors were in the ready position with pen in hand documenting the entirety of Allen's mental and physical deterioration and actions stemming therefrom. The infringements on Allen's legal rights didn't stop here. Inmate companions then spread the good word of Allen's confessions to inmates in general population at Westville, prompting these inmates to then share the information with their respective family members in the public. Here's the transcripts from Lacey Patton Jr. and Jason Elliott. <clears throat> Proof of these leaks were offered up by the state in the form of audio recorded interviews and accompanying transcripts and included in large volumes of discovery dumps received by the defense in the recent past. However, neither Allen nor his legal team are aware of any self-reporting of said leaks by the state to the defense or by the state to the court. Despite the fact that the state was aware of this information as early as May 12, 2023, when Patton and Elliot were interviewed by law enforcement investigators, Allen's due process rights have been all but ignored. So let's break that down really quick. <clears throat> there was information being leaked from the prison because the warden had a companion program where he had other inmates taking notes outside of Allen's cell. Law enforcement becomes aware of this and they don't tell anybody? Hmm. Interesting. Oh, we have though. We have heard of these leaks. We have with these people, these YouTube creators that consistently are like, he's confessing. He confessed again. He confessed to somebody else. He confessed to somebody else. And they keep putting it out there. And when you ask for sources, they don't tell you. So back in May, both of these people were interviewed by law enforcement investigators. And nobody knew until recently, except for these random ass YouTubers who happened to, well, be somewhat correct and somewhat incorrect. Because it looks like they were stating he confessed to, um, you know, the, the, the staff. Well, it looks like it's not the staff. It looks like it's other prisoners. Wait, I watched a woman on someone's YouTube when he was moved, and she said she was in contact with one of the inmates. I do remember that, but I don't actually remember what was said. I don't remember what was said. I don't even know if I took it seriously at the time. Now I think we should go back and find that interview and watch it. Watch it, yeah. Hold on to that. The magic bullet. Oksana! How can people who are... So pro-prosecution pro also say they are pro-constitution. Wasn't constitution written to protect people from the government overreach? Yep, that's exactly what it's for. Why do we have 2A to say that we trust the government? Nonsensical. Exactly. Exactly. That is what it is. It, it, the constitution is created to protect us so that the government can't do these types of things. This is That's where I'm at with it. I mean, some of these YouTubers were chirping Klein for info, probably found inmates too. Oh, yeah. Mental gymnastics. 
overreach of power. Hi, Dr. Vanda. How many people do you think are going to go live and make fun of Richard Allen? How many people do you think are going to go live and make fun of him? You don't have to name the people. Just give me an idea of how many people do you think are going to go live and make fun of him. Good night, Seth. It was so good to see you. A lot. Yeah. Now, I, yeah, there's definitely going to be a handful that I can tell you right now that are going to be like, oh, look at he's fucking eating his own shit. Oh. I will get timed out if I name. Yeah, you don't have to name him. Yeah, do it, do it, do it, do it. It is also established that the 14th Amendment forbids fundamental unfairness in the use of evidence, whether true or false. As important as it is that persons who have committed crimes be convicted, there are considerations that transcend the question of guilt or innocence. Thus, in cases involving involuntary confessions, this court enforces the strong, strongly felt attitude of our society that important human values are sacrificed, where an agency of the government in the course of securing a conviction, rings a conviction out of an accused against his will. This, inst this insistence upon putting the government to the task of proving guilt by means other than inquisition was en engendered by historical abuses, which are quite familiar. Allen's statements are of no consequence to this analysis. Allen has been treated unlike any other pretrial detainee in Indiana in recent history. The methodology employed by... The justice system is one of first impression, and therefore the circumstances created by this methodology should not be part of any consideration of Allen's guilt or innocence. The system of pretrial detention employment against Allen runs afoul of the Fifth and Sixth Amendments of the United States Constitution and Article 1, Section 14 of the Indiana Constitution. It is for these reasons any and all incriminating statements made by Allen while incarcerated should be suppressed. Now, here's the thing. That that she's not going to do that. I, I mean, I'm just going to be realistic here. She's not going to do that. But the bigger part is is going to be that no matter whether she takes this and says, okay, we're going to suppress them or we're not going to suppress them, she's not because she didn't even have a problem with how he was being held. She's okay with the fact that he was in the DOC, even though they have requested for him to be moved multiple times, multiple times. So I I, I don't foresee her doing anything to to suppress these confessions. The bigger thing is going to be this jury of 12 who ultimately will have the final say that they'll get to hear this. They'll get to hear it for themselves. And so these confessions, and we don't know which conf like how many there are at this point. We don't know what's going on with the ones from his, you know, to his wife. We know that they're talking about it all being within the same time frame of all this really fucking crazy shit happening. We also know that for some reason, the attorney general decided to pop in and say, hey, we're moving him in the middle of the night and we're not telling anybody, essentially. So we know that. Hmm. So does a jury of 12 go, okay, this guy confessed. In one of those confessions, he's stating that he shot them, that he shot the girls in the back. Hi, Travis. I think that was primarily written by footnote <laughs> to hook in a way to file a federal habeas corpus action with his IU law school practicum group. Uh, very possible. 
if the jury hears EF confession next to Richard Allen's confession, it's not good for the prosecution. No. It's absolutely going to the Seventh Circuit of Hell. I added that part, sorry. It is shocking how many people still think that this is some kind of loophole. Pretenders draw the line at eating it, I'll bet. They may fling it around a bit, but I don't think anyone in their right mind could bring themselves to eat it. I just don't either. And it, Ursa agrees. And that's well, it's also why that I always thought that um, if there was a confession that lined up with anything and it wasn't this quote unquote generic confession that we keep hearing about, I thought that for sure that for sure that McLeland or one of his cohorts would have put that in the filing. Like would have quoted it. Okay, well, 13 minute timestamp. Okay, let me, we'll watch this real quick. Oh, was it on Frank Meister's? Okay. Um, let me bring this over here. If you don't, if you don't have sound, let me know. And like I said, I get that. I get that there's people that you guys don't like. Just don't, no name. Just don't name call. Like I get along with Frank Meister, and I get like not everybody does. So. If you guys don't have sound, let me know. 13 minutes. That's whose channel it was. I do remember this. If you want me to, sure. Well, it's got to come from the horse's mouth. I don't want to relay <laughs> something that came from you, so I'll let you do it. Okay. Let me let me read the email that I received, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, that's fine. So anybody, just mods, if there's any name calling, just please delete those comments. I just don't want any name calling. Uh, I received an email today and it was dated Monday, 4.45 a.m. And it's just from Wabash um, Valley Correctional Facility. And the very last paragraph of it was that he, meaning Richard Allen, had attempted suicide at the other facility and making accusations that he wasn't being fed and mistreated. He's under suicide watch in a cell with cameras monitoring him 24 hours and 15 in 15 minute rounds in person checks. I know on the news, they did not reveal reasons for transfer. Well, I will attempt another call within the next couple of days. And yep, the Colts and players, and it went on into a personal thing about uh, Colts and the Pacers that this other individual and I have talked about. But um, but that basically saying that Richard Allen had attempted suicide at Westville. Um, and that's one of the reasons why he had been moved in to uh, Wabash. Oh, really? See, that's... Okay, I guess here's a couple things, though. So she's talking about a letter that she received from a prisoner in Wabash, which is where he was moved to. So I'm really interested to know how that person would know that he tried to commit suicide at the other facility. I mean, not that people don't talk and say things, but... Okay. Hold on one second. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hey, Tia, are you still listening by chance, Tia? Are you here? Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hold on, my messenger's like blowing up. Uh, I don't know. Apparently Buttercup is like real mad. Freaking Buttercup.
Right. This a, it's a video. Yeah, this is a video. So we're talking about that this lady was talking to somebody who was from Wabash, though, and that the reason he got moved was because he had tried to commit suicide in Westville. That's surprise. That I mean, honestly, did he do that <laughs> once before? When um, sometime this year. The only thing that we really knew about what he did up in Westfield back then is he was eating his damn his uh, discovery. Hey. <laughs> because yeah. he was eating and, and not eating. That's all mm -hmm. we knew of. Well, he said that he had accused the facility of Westville of not feeding him um, at this, and that's one of the reasons why he has a an axe to grind, so to speak. With what this it? facility, right? Okay. And oh, well, uh, like well, on June fifteenth, when that guy was running, he said we tried to get him to eat, but he wouldn't eat. I mean, that's on his own on on, on accord, and yeah. they cannot force feed him. Well, they not can't force it. him to shower either if they don't want to take a shower. So, I mean, they're not going. I mean, the guards aren't going to do that for him. They're not. They're not there to babysit him. They're. They're. It's there. They can offer it to him, but if he doesn't want to take a bath or a shower, he's not going to, you know, the guards aren't going to wash his un underarms for him. So, well, and they're not wrong. They're not going to force feed him and they're not going to force him to take a shower. But I, now, just depending on wh what you believe, one side saying that he wasn't even given the opportunity to take a shower, that that was part of his privileges that were taken away. And, you know, a lot of people thought that he ate the discovery. Which, once again, it's all—it's not implausible. It's just now, if we're looking at, once again, the totality of everything that we're learning as time goes on, he's eating his discovery because he doesn't want anybody to see what they gave him. That was kind of the whole logic behind that. But now tell me, what's the logic behind eating your own shit? Like, that you, there's something fucking, there's something wrong. Well, yeah, I don't know how the prisons work here, so I know a little bits of the ins and outs because my cousin was up in Westfield for armed robbery. Guy, well, this is bitch. from this is from somebody that's in, in. They do force showers if an inmate refuses for an extended period of time. Interesting. And Sleuthy says, it, "You know what? I've never been, so I, I don't know, and I don't know enough about it. But, uh, but yes, they absolutely, positively will force feed you." Um, I was in the courtroom that day in June. If you have any questions, um, well, I think that we're learning a lot more today than we even knew back in June. In Wabash. Wabash, right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I know some people that were there, too, in Wabash, too. No, so he's a, there now. Right. A buddy of mine was there, and he's been trying to get a hold of a couple of people that are still there through uh, the iPads because they use all emails when they communicate right oh and that's the other thing you know he confessed via um to his wife you know via this tablet that he supposedly broke um i'm going to put this in here this is frank meister's channel this is the interview with this person i'm not sure that she's incorrect i'm just very curious on how this inmate that's writing to her would know any of this Oh, Lone Pony, are you serious? It's a protective mechanism. I promise it's a thing. Inmates do that to keep from being essayed. My God. Um, I don't know her name. She she was um she she knows somebody who's in the Wabash facility. So Regarding the clothes, they did testify that a lot of his commissary money was spent on extra clothes. So he had clean clothes the day they took that picture. Um, but what? how long did he have clean clothes before that? When did he buy that? Uh, Scottish Queen says, my opinion apparently when I confessed to his wife, when... He confessed to his wife. He was talking to himself and to people that weren't real. All he said was, I did it. He could be talking to someone he sees, talking about anything. Well, I think the whole thing about, we, like I said, they put in here the contents of, of one of the confessions, and it is not accurate at all. 
yeah, they put him in prison green. Like, oh, no, he's fine. And place him in a feeding tube. It was a suicide smock. He had clean clothes, but he still had doo-doo breath. We don't know. We just know that a couple of months that this was happening during, we don't... Um, we don't know the timeline of what things happened when. Let me drop this one more time. If you guys want to go back and listen to this lady's interview on Frank Meister's channel, please feel free. Um, okay, so this is the last one. Essentially, they're asking for um, the ability to depose inmates. So it comes down defendant Richard M. Allen by counsel, Brad Rosie, and pursuant to Rule 30A of the Indiana Rules of Trial Procedure, respectfully request that this court issue an order granting leave of court, allowing the legal team of Richard Allen to conduct depositions of inmates at the Westville Correctional Facility. In support of said motion, defendant Allen states as follows, the parties are in the process of conducting discovery by way of depositions in preparation for May 13th jury trial in this cause. The state, in its witness and exhibit list dated March 8th, 2024, has identified a number of correctional officers and inmates that the state intends to call as witnesses in this cause. Most, if not all, these inmates are associated with the Westville Correctional Facility where Defendant Allen was housed for over a year before his transfer in December of 2023. The defense desires to depose one incarcerated individual named Jesse James. I stand. Attorney Rosie believes that inmate James is currently housed in the Westville Correctional Facility. Anybody pull this guy up yet? Anybody pull up Jesse James and see what he's incarcerated for? The Westville Correctional Facility is located in a fairly remote area. Attorney Rosie has attempted to secure a location to conduct said depositions in the town of Westville just a mile or two down the road but has been unable to do so due to the fact that the Westville is a very small town with very few locations that are suitable for such circumstance. <clears throat> it's in my DM. Okay. Attorney Rosie was able to seek out and secure a space at the La Porte County Sheriff's Department in La Porte, I don't know how you say that, Indiana, approximately 20 miles from Westville Correctional Facility. This is the closest and most accommodating location where Attorney Rosie was able to secure an adequate space to conduct depositions of the above referenced inmate and other prison employees not referenced in this pleading. Attorney Rosie respectfully requests that this court issue an order granting his request to conduct the deposition of inmate James. Attorney Rosie has made arrangements for said depositions to occur at the County Sheriff's Department on Thursday, April 18th. Com That's this Thursday, isn't it? That's this coming. It's a week from today. Um, at 8 a.m., at which time desires to depose inmate James and... Attorney Rosie requests that this court issue an order granting leave of court and directing the Indiana Department of Corrections to transport inmate Jesse James to said deposi deposition and therefore return Jesse James to his respective location of incarceration. Laporte. Okay, around here we say Laporte. Got it. Okay, let me go back over here. Uh, between. Uh, okay, let me see. Let me see. Okay, so sexual misconduct with a minor. Great. Great. Let me download this. Pull it up for you guys. So Jesse James, DOC 271835, all a match. His earliest release is... Why is that not wanting to pull up correctly? There it goes. Okay, so um, his earliest release is 5-2 of 2026. He was sentenced back in 2021, sexual misconduct with a minor. Seven years, type of conviction is a felony, class four. If I'm not a scrappy hardened criminal, then I would want some degree of protection and not gen pop. Kind of why Chris Watts can't be just in gen pop. Well, he's a chicken shit. <laughs> he went down in flames. Yes, yeah, sexual Laporte. Okay, it is Laporte. Thank you, guys. 
There's a site called Prison Writers where inmates have writing outlet and their stories are published. Oh, geez. Who's the inmate that wrote the letters about how they were treating him? That one that, that sent them to the lady that was on Frank Meister's? I don't know. I think it, I think she talks about it in the interview. But like I said, I, I barely paid attention to it when it happened. Um, just because it's so hard to tell. We know if people are, and not to say she's a liar, because I don't mean that, but it's just so hard to tell with any type of accuracy when you have people writing the people in prison. You know, sometimes it's actually just people they know. Sometimes it's not. Oh, oh, that's the one you're talking about. Robert Baston is the one who put letters on the record about his treatment. Yes, and he's the one that said um, that he didn't want Judge Gold to make him come to that hearing in June. And so she didn't make him come, even though there was a subpoena for him. I don't know how she just says, okay, yeah, you don't have to. Like, he really shouldn't have had a choice. But I don't know. It is what it is. So, yeah, that's the one who had written letters prior. Correct. So we have another one. And this one is going to be now, how does that make any sense? So it's like, nope, Robert Baston, piece of shit. We don't believe anything he says, not reliable. And then you have Mr. Jesse James. And as Steven says, you name your kid Jesse James, what do you expect to happen? I mean, it's going to be, a, he's going to have, going to live that, that felon lifestyle. And so now they're going to use him as a witness to say, yeah, he did confess to me. It's sad when you don't know if you can trust the words of the inmates or the correctional officers. Right. Well, you've got, you've got, oh my gosh, it's fucking mess. You got these prisoners who, when they testify, they have to go back to that prison with those fucking same guards. So yeah, they may be pieces of shit, but I mean, are they telling the truth? Who knows? Are the freaking prison guards telling the truth? They're the ones wearing the Odin patches. I mean, so essentially right now we know that there's multiple confessions. And the one that we're quoting is one that they're quoting is saying that he shot the girls and molested them. Another one is saying that he's sorry that he molested them, which now I think it's pretty much confirmed because even though we all, we all had heard that there was no sexual assault, I don't know if it's actually been written in any court documents, but so there is no sexual assault. Doesn't mean that it couldn't be sexually motivated, but him saying he molested the girls and he's sorry that he molested the girls. So they're going to put these convicted felons on the stand and say, yeah, he confessed to me. And what he said wasn't even true. It wasn't, it wasn't even accurate. I don't know. Seems kind of weird. All right, you guys. Well, that's that's Delphi for today. It's another fucking day. Of who the hell knows what the hell's happening in this case? It's definitely not ordinary, and I think that's one of the reasons that people become so enthralled with it. Is statistically, these types of things just don't, you know, type of crime doesn't happen. We everything when it comes to t statistics, this case is like, nope, uh, uh, fuck you. We're gonna we're gonna do something different. We don't have people that are arrested for crimes like this and then put into solitary confinement in a prison before they're even tried. No DNA. First time, first, first time this guy commits a crime and he's obviously really good at it that he doesn't get caught for five and a half years. Doesn't leave any DNA behind. Doesn't ha doesn't have anything as, as far as we know that connects him to the crime scene besides an unspent round, which we don't know how long was even there. I don't know. I <laughs> know, Scottish Queen. Thanks. Appreciate you. <laughs> it's a lot. I don't know. I don't know the right answers here. I am, I, I'm really hoping that there is a... Hold on, I have to cough. Really hoping that we are actually are having our trial in May. I mean, it seems right now that that is, that is what's happening. So, and I'm gonna, I'm working on getting my way out there for the last week of the trial. After they arrested Arya, I submitted proof that Arya is innocent, and they can't just swallow their pride and release him. Well, no, they're not going to. They need it. They need him to be guilty. 
whether he is guilty or not, like they, they, everything they have now is pinned on that. Mm hmm. Um, was there something about a gag order today or this week? Yeah, a news source came out with that there was a new gag order put in place. And it was weird because I started talking about it at the beginning of the live. And when I went to pull up the, the source, they've deleted the article. And I was saying, like, it didn't really make any sense that there's a new gag order. I'm thinking what happened was somebody had reached out to the court and it was asking about Hennessy and that Hennessy was talking because the ultimate ending of it was there is a gag order in place for Baldwin, Rosie, the prosecutors, law enforcement, but that the gag order does not expend, extend to the attorneys that are representing Baldwin and Rosie. So I think that it was just somebody who was looking for clarification and then they wrote that article and it was wrong. So they took it down. Yeah. The state is in too deep. They can't back out now. It's all bullshit and they are liars. Yeah, probably. But I mean, that's what I'm saying. Once this trial's once this trial's underway, what they say up there, like what you know, they're all gonna have they're all gonna be questioned. All the law enforcement officers, these quote unquote witnesses that they're putting on the stand, they're all gonna have to answer for this. And we're gonna end up knowing what really happened. There isn't gonna be any more the lawyer said this and the lawyer said that. We're gonna know what these medical health professionals actually said was going on with him. We're gonna know what these inmates say he confessed to. We're going to know what these inmates, if they're reliable or not, or we're going to have our own determination of that. And how, yeah, how's that plea deal coming? I, I just, I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. Everybody's like adamant about this plea deal, but I just don't know. I don't know why there would be a plea deal because if, if, even if that one confession is true and, and there's other confessions that say other things, now you have complete inconsistencies in what he's confessing to. The jury's going to hear that. And I don't think that Baldwin and Rosie are looking to take a plea. I'm sorry, I just don't. And I know that's not up to them. It's actually up to Richard Allen, but it makes no sense. So, all right, I'm going to wrap it up. I think that Bob is having a live tonight. Let me go see if I can find it so I can send you guys that way. I don't know what time he was having a live, though. Um, let me see. Oh, he's live currently. Oh. Well, dang, did he like just go live? Okay, let me go in and I'm going to, I'll switch it so you guys can just be sent straight over there. And then um, as soon as I'm feeling better, I want to go and cut, I want to cover all the Idaho for the, the last two hearings with Idaho. And then we've got Chad Daybell's trial that's underway and I'm now behind from not feeling well. So I've got to catch up on that and I was going to do it with you guys. So let's redirect. We'll send you over to Bob. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? There he is. All right. I'm going to save that and I'm going to play the outro and I will see you guys on the next one. And as always, I very much appreciate you guys being here. Thank you for all of you who have hung out, who have helped me and have wished me, you know, to get well. Um, I know that you guys have a thousand other places that you could spend your time and yet you choose to spend your time with me. And I, I greatly, greatly appreciate each and every single one of you, whether we like each other or we don't like each other, or we agree on a case or we don't agree on a case. I still appreciate all of you. So go enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Like I said, if I'm feeling up to it, I might do a late night one um, or I might just do one in the morning if I'm not. So I'll see you guys later and have a good one.
Heading into the unknown 